I'm dishing with musicians. I'm dishing with musicians. A talk show about history. I'm dishing with musicians. I'm dishing with musicians. Let's take a stroll down music history. There it is, folks. How are you tonight? I hope you're good, because I'm great. I'm aflame. I'm buzzing. This is going to be a great show tonight, and I hope you're tuning in. We've got five people already. They've just been chomping at the bit like hungry thoroughbreds to get in. All right. So tonight's pretty special. Um, one of the greats, they call him all kinds of monikers. And I'll let him, I'll let him decide what his favorite one is because I've, I've heard of many. The Prince of Roots music, uh, the Hollywood hero. I mean, the list goes on and on. So it's, uh, it's pretty thrilling when you start digging into the, uh, the fold of this guy. It's pretty incredible. Um, but I want to get him on. We don't have much time. Uh, so he's a busy guy. He's probably working on 18,000 projects. So we're very lucky to have him on the program tonight. Dishing with Musicians wants to welcome Mr. Deke Dickerson. Deke. Hey, there I am. <laughs> How's it going, How man? You doing? I, it's going great. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Nice to meet you. This is, uh, this is an absolute thrill for me. So, uh. Yeah, lots of six degrees of separation between you and I, and and it's kind of a you know like we talked about uh, in this little pre meeting we had you know there's so many um, so much of that occurs in this style of music in this genre when you start talking about you know roots music in general. Um, I book a roots festival in Nebraska, so I, I know a lot of people that you know. I'm also I also attended Ameripolitan Awards and you know know Dale Watson and all those guys, and I'm sure you're very familiar with all those cats. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, thank and, you. You know, it, it is it is a fairly small world uh, in the the roots music scene. It it is, and it's kind of become smaller and smaller with more conversations. And you know, the the pandemic had its weird effect on everybody. And this uh, this show is because of the pandemic. And I've I've you know I've decided to continue it because it's so cool. And I think people get you know they get a nice thrill out of it. So. You know, some good Great. things happen, and, I, and I'm sure you can relate. Um, but before I want to talk about your big pandemic project, which we will get to, um, I want to talk, I, I always like to go back to the beginning with people. And, and I like to find out where, you know, where the, you know, where the threads start coming together, where the love happened for this thing we call music. Um, and you're a Midwest kid. That's right. Yeah. A Missouri boy. Awesome. I love it. Is it Columbia that you're from? I was born in St. Louis and uh, lived, I, I, I always call Columbia my hometown. That's where I grew up and went to high school and my dad still lives there. So, you know, that's that's my hometown. Oh, right on. Cool, cool. So, so do you actually make it back there to play once in a while or do you just call it your hometown? Yeah. Um, in fact, uh, I was just back there a couple of months ago. Uh, and yeah, I seems like I play there once or twice a year. Oh, that's great. Good, good. That's great. Dad still, you know, um, I take it your, did your dad get you into music? No, my dad always joked that, uh, he couldn't even play the radio. Oh, that's hilarious. Okay, but, so you uh, had no family music connection at all. You had no... Well, no, that's not true. Uh, you know, okay. they say it skips a generation. If you go back further, uh, all my family on both sides were uh, hillbillies from Virginia, uh, Floyd County, Virginia. And there was a lot of music going back. Uh, you know, my my grandmother on my dad's side was a big influence. She played auto harp and guitar and organ and harmonica. And, you know, every time you went to her house, she would put on a show for you. Uh, it would always kind of culminate in her taking off her shoes and doing some kind of flat footing dance. Uh, you know, it was, it was, it was wow. a trip. And then, uh, my, my grandfather on my mom's side, he was a guitar player and, uh, yeah, you know, going, going back even further than that, I've got some real old pictures of, uh, great grandfathers and great uncles and stuff playing in string bands. So yeah, there's definitely there music in the family. Oh, there it is. That's so it's like Appalachian mountains kind of good roots music. Yeah. Oh yeah. my gosh. 
That's incredible. So, so you definitely, so did you, do you remember as a kid seeing these things and kind of going, huh, that might be kind of fun. Yeah. I remember seeing a bluegrass band when we went back to visit the grandmas uh, in Virginia and they were just kind of playing at a park and I was just fascinated by it. You know, I'd never really seen anything like that. And um, that really kind of sparked this interest in, you know, old country music, I guess. Uh, one one funny story. I'll, I'll try to make this the quick version of the story. <laughs> is when I when I got into music, on my grandma Dickerson side, it was like, okay, well, look, you're the one that's into music of the family. We have this treasured keepsake. It is a Charlie Pool's fiddle, and you know, I don't know if you know who Charlie Pool is. Oh, totally. He was a, a famous, you know, 1920s. I think he died right at the beginning of the 1930s, a uh, musician from North Carolina. And the story was, is that he came into Floyd, Virginia to play a gig and he sold uh, this, this fiddle to, I, I'm gonna get the story wrong here, but I think uh, my, my great grandfather. And they had this fiddle and they were passing it down and they always kind of spoke about it in hushed tones. Uh, and then when I finally discovered Charlie Poole and got into it a little bit, it's like, well, wait a minute, Charlie Poole was a banjo player. Like, what What the hell is this? But they did apparently buy this fiddle from Charlie Poole. And I've always wondered, it might have been, uh, I think Posey Rohrer was the guy who played fiddle in his band. Oh, I wonder if he sto stole Posey's fiddle to sell to get some whiskey, you know, because he was oh, sort of famous yeah. for being this... Uh, hardcore alcoholic so i i always wonder oh. like well where did he get the fiddle and he obviously needed the 10 bucks like right there and then so i thought but maybe I, I have to all kinds of instruments maybe but yeah i remember hearing his name i used to work at the old town school He's... of music in chicago his name came up all the time i i did a lot of research to see if he ever played any other instruments and the answer is no he the was a banjo that. player that's he, amazing uh, he's... He's kind of famous for being the guy who started the three finger roll on the banjo. You know, obviously oh, sure. Earl Scruggs, Scruggs came along and and uh, and took it to a whole other level. But but Pool was the first guy to come along and do that, so as he, opposed he, to you know the claw hammer style or the oh, frailing wow. style. He was doing a roll precursor to Scruggs. Yeah, correct. That's incredible, really. Yeah, because he because he died in 1931, I think, or third something like that. You know, it's funny, like the people that get credit for these styles of music, like finger style, of course, you know, Merle Travis, we're going to talk about him a little later, but, yeah. you know, he wasn't the first one to do that either. You know, so you got, you, you got all these people that sort of, you know, they, they might've done it in front of bigger crowds and they got the credit, right? Sure. Yeah. We'll, we'll get into that whenever we uh, get into the Merle Travis thing. Yeah. Well, well, here we are. So, so, okay. So, so I want to jump in because, you know, uh, I'm a guitar collector, you might tell. Uh, I love guitars, um, and some of my people that listen to this show are also guitar collectors. I know my father is. He lives in Fremont, Nebraska, which is about an hour north of me here in Lincoln. And I know you've played in Nebraska. You've played at the Zoo Bar specifically, which we yeah. love and adore, the world-famous Zoo Bar. Um, and, by the way, Pete uh, Waters says we have to get you back. we got to get you back. I would love to get back. All right. I don't, know, I don't know why it's been so long. I think the last time I was there was with uh, Reverend Horton Heat. We played a theater around the corner from the zoo bar. Oh, and that's it. been a that's been a few years ago. So I'm yeah. not yeah. sure not sure why it's been that long, but I would love to get back there and and yeah, yeah I played played the zoo bar a bunch of times and I used to play Omaha too, although that's even been longer. That's almost 20 years ago that there was like a swing dance night they had in Omaha, and I played oh, that cool. uh, four or five times. But oh, that, hey, but if yeah, anybody's, yeah, if anybody's listening out there and knows about that swing night, comment about that because I don't know about that. I was in Chicago for ten years, and I moved back to Lincoln about ten years ago. So, so I'm there was a period in there where I from like three to thirteen where I missed everything that went on here in Lincoln. But, but that sounds super fun. Um, so what got me into that? I was going to ask you something. Oh, because I, because I collect guitars, I want to know what your first guitar ever was. That's what I want to know. Well, okay. So <laughs> I saw Chug Berry on TV and this would have been in the 1970s. I was a little boy and he was playing a Gibson ES-335. It was red, double cutaway, uh, or it might've been an E-355, sorry. But when I 
decided I wanted to play electric guitar. I went to the local music store and, and we lived for a couple of years in Blacksburg, Virginia. My mom was teaching college there. Okay. And there was a music store in Blacksburg, Virginia that had a Framus ES-335 copy. Now, this was a German-made guitar from the nope. 1950s or 60s. Right. And um, the action was about that high off the fretboard. I mean, it was it was a real dog. I still have this guitar, and it is a terrible guitar. Oh, uh, but I, I was like, that's like Chuck Berry's guitar. I have to have it. And so, you know, I took my birthday money and my Christmas money and, and I bought this guitar. It was $150. And, uh, and that was really how I first started teaching myself how to play 50s rock and roll, which is what I was into. I was a very weird little 13-year-old kid. That's awesome. I actually own a Framus 1964 from Bavaria, Germany. Uh, crazy guitar. It's a classical guitar, but it's got a violin back to it, an arch, like an arch violin back. I don't know if you've seen these, but Frame has kind of put out some cool stuff, but they also put out a lot of junk. You know, they're they're interesting because uh, this guitar, like the workmanship on it, is really nice. the The metal parts, like the pickups and the and the bridge and the vibrato tailpiece. They're really, really nice, and they work very, very well. But I think they had a shortage of hardwoods, uh, even in the 1950s and 60s after World War II. Uh, so, or maybe, you know, maybe they weren't allowed to use it. Maybe the hardwoods had to go into rebuilding buildings from World War II. I don't know what the problem right. is. But, but Framus made their necks by gluing together these little thin strips of wood so there were like these laminated necks that had these, you know, 15 little yeah. stripes of wood in there. And some of them have survived okay. I've played premises that played fine, but mine just warped like hell. And, and Oh, just wow. Mess. Right. Just It's all conditional. Probably just depends on where you're storing it and what it's seen over the years, I'd imagine. Or, yeah, or what kind of glue the guy was using on Friday afternoon. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, right. Exactly. That's amazing. Well, you know, you're kind of like, you know, sometimes I get this way too with people locally that contact me. You know, I get calls and text messages, you know, I found this guitar at a garage sale or I found, you know, you seem like I've been following you on social media probably now for like four or five years. And, and I got to say your threads are unbelievably funny. If, if anybody's listening out there and doesn't follow Deke, you, you have to. His Instagram, Facebook page is really funny. Do you do Twitter? I don't know. I don't necessarily do Twitter all that much. But. I do Twitter, but but you know, it's like uh, whenever I post something, I get three likes. So oh, sure, I don't yeah. have much. I don't have much of a mark over there. Yeah, right. But you seem to have a huge mark on Facebook and Instagram. But your your threads are hilariously funny, and not only that, you're kind of like a, you know, you're a beacon, so to speak, for all these killer guitars and stories, which I love. You know. I'm a story hound as well with all my guitars have a crazy story, um, you know, whether it be good or infamous or whatever. But um, I, I wasn't planning on jumping into this early, but there's a guy that I came across a story you told. Uh, his name was Gino King. Mm -hmm. And this story, you, you've got to share at least a little bit of this because it's 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 one of the most endearing cool stories and you have a few of those from what i remember over the years but this particular one is is pretty sweet it's really something i i really enjoyed uh gino king so gino king was a guitar player from up in wisconsin who played with a bunch of well-known people back in the late 1950s through the 1970s he was little jimmy dickens guitar player for about 15 years he also toured with uh, Carl Smith and Ray Price and uh, uh, Roger Miller. And, you know, he, he, he was just a, a guy who was very well known to the people in Nashville. Everybody knew Gino. Now, the funny thing is, is that the story started because there was a Gretsch 6120 for sale in the San Francisco Bay Area that was supposedly it was being advertised as chet atkins 6120 gretch and looking at it it's like well okay this is like a 1955 gretch 
and it's got these custom features on it. It had like a sparkle pit guard and a couple extra knobs. Like this very possibly could be Chet Atkins guitar. And I asked the guy, I said, what's the story on this Chet Atkins Gretsch? And he said, well, it belonged to a guy named Gino King and he's from <laughs> Wisconsin, right? So I remembered seeing this, you've shown it on the screen there. He made an album called the Bang Bang Guitar of oh, right. Gino King. Yep, and I had seen it. that album. Yeah, I had seen that album and I knew that he at one time he had played a double neck Mose, right? And so I just, I did a web search for Gino King and literally they had just pub published an article in La Crosse, Wisconsin, like the week before about how Gino King, the famous country Western guitar player was now living in an assisted li living home in downtown La Crosse. Oh my and gosh. And so I called him up and, uh, and I said, you know, Gino, look, I'm, I'm coming to Green Bay in a couple of weeks. Could I swing through La Crosse and, and meet you? And so I swung through La Crosse and it was very sad. He, he was basically destitute. He was living at this assisted living center uh, for indigent oh, wow. people, basically downtown. And so I asked him, I said, I showed him a picture of this Gretsch 6120. And I said, what's the story on this? He goes, yeah, that's my guitar. I said, well, the guy selling it uh, says that it originally belonged to Chet Atkins. And Gino said, Nah, I made that up. I was just trying to get more money for it when I sold it. Oh shit! So, <laughs> so I mean, that was that was my that was my intro to Gino, and he was such a character. I mean, I spent about four or five hours with him that first day, and it was just all these X-rated stories of, you know, girls and drugs and alcohol and pills and just everything you could imagine. He just had no filter. And he was just telling. Oh this incredible story of you know his own personal career and and who was a nice guy and who was a jerk and and you know who slept with who and whatever and, <laughs> and so you know eventually the the conversation got around to well whatever happened to that double neck mose right that was on the cover of bang bang guitar and he said right. well when he was playing with little jimmy dickens little jimmy ordered that double neck mose right for him as a as a surprise wow and he treasured that guitar for, he had it for, I don't know, 12 or 13 years. And after the little Jimmy gig ended, he was touring with a guy named Leroy Van Dyke, who had a big song with the auctioneer and walk on by. And Can I ask so this what, yeah. what, what, excuse me, what year did he tour with little Jimmy Dickens? I'm curious. Do you remember? Uh, good question. I think that he played with him for about, 11 or 12 years and i would i would say probably like 63 to okay. 75 something okay. like that and, and i don't think he's on that. i don't think he's on any of the records because whenever they would record in nashville they would have to use grady martin and hank garland or you know those studio guys Big hitter too. uh the reason i know is on oh go ahead the, the the reason i asked my uncle toured with little jimmy dickens in 58 and that oh, was nice. the, yeah, that was the first time they took the Grand Ole Opry on the road, and it was a very interesting time period for. What was what, who was your what was your uncle's name? Uh, he's from Norfolk, Nebraska. He was billed as the next Elvis Presley in '58. His name was Dick Allison, and oh, he nice. was with yep, and he was with a band called the Bromes, and okay. he came out yep he came out with a um, a forty five that hit big. Um, he had a song. Oh, I'm gonna have to. Gosh darn, this is terrible. I'm gonna have to look it up real quick. I'm gonna have to look that up after we get off. Yeah, I'm, in fact, I, you might even you might even have uh, seen his um, his 45 because I know you're a collector. Um, it, it, they re-released it on a, a teen scene volume three, and okay. um, and it was called Dream World of Love, and it was put out in 1960. But on the on the flip side. Dad, if you're listening out there, I think he might be listening. There was a song called Tiki Love or something Tiki. But uh, but it was interesting. The band was called Dick Allison and the Bromes. And on the other side, it was it was Ron Thompson and the Bromes. So they literally, on the same 45, put a different guy's name as the lead singer. Right. That's so funny. it was really strange. But yeah, Johnny Cash, real quick. Johnny Cash rolled through Omaha in 58. Uh, my uncle had the had the Kuyans to ask him to open up and let him sing one song. And he sang one song, but had four standing ovations. 
And nice. uh, oh, so Tiki Guitar was the flip side. Dad says here. Oh, ah, very cool. Yeah, and but anyway, Johnny Cash took him uh, after after that and took him on a uh, steak dinner and a bottle of wine and took him on the road with him and said, "Hey, nice. you're, you're going on the road." But uh, but your little Jimmy cool. Dickens was on that tour. Uh, you know, all, all the Carter family was on that tour. Uh, George Jones, I believe, Jerry Lee was on yeah. that tour. But crazy stuff. But like yeah, anyway, not to interrupt. Well, Sorry. To- that's okay. So getting getting back to the guitar, I asked him what happened to the Moserite double neck, and he said that he was touring with Leroy Van Dyke sometime in the mid to late 1970s, and he said the double neck guitar was getting more attention from the crowd than Leroy was getting from the crowd. Oh, no. So Ler- Leroy forced him to sell the double neck guitar when they were in Colorado. He was very specific about that. He said, we were in Colorado, and he said, you have to sell that guitar, and so he sold it. And he got, you know, a Gibson or something like that, something much plainer. Wow. And so being the detective that I am, you know, I, I was like trying to keep my eye open for Geno King's guitar. And then all of a sudden on eBay, there was a Moseride double neck in uh, Colorado Springs. I'm like, holy crap, there it is. It was it was very obviously wow. the same guitar. It had this bird's eye maple top with a maple strip going through the center and yeah. the back of the guitar which you can't see from the record covers, Gino had described it as a purple to cream sunburst, which is wild. And Super I, rare, yeah. They, they showed pictures of the backside of it, and I was like, that's Gino's guitar. Wow. So I, and it wasn't that much money. I mean, in the in the grand scheme of, of Moseride double necks, I mean, I think it was three grand or something like that. And I know that there's going to be people out there in the audience who say, that's a lot of money. But, you know, you <laughs> see people asking, you know, eight to 12 to, Right. More than that. So this, it was reasonably priced. I bought the guitar. I got it home. And then I thought, I got to put this in Gino's hands again. Right. So I you got to bring this back to him. You, you bought I, I I bought the guitar and uh, I had to fix I had to fix a few things. It was kind of, it was a little bit boogered up. But uh, okay. a good friend of mine, Garrett Emil, got it playable again and wow. got some proper the right parts on it and everything. And so then I was heading back up to the Midwest. I brought the guitar back to Gino. And, you know, at, at first I thought, I just want to give him the guitar back. But the problem was, is he was living in this just ratty, you know, assisted living place. I could tell that if I gave him the guitar, it was going to get stolen out Um, of that place. It was just, it was just a bad scenario. So mm -hmm. the, the real hero of the story is there's a music store up there in La Crosse, Wisconsin called Dave's Guitar Shop. And uh, I contacted Dave and and he knew Gino, you know, Gino was a local character, kind of a local legend. And I said, look, what if I brought this guitar back and you guys like did a big, you know, made a big to do out of it and had Gino there. And then you had like a display case for it. And and Dave was all for it. He's like, yeah, let's do that. And so I brought the guitar back and I met Gino over at Dave's guitar shop and we got these pictures of, Gino playing it again, and he had tears coming out down his oh, eyes. And uh, and beautiful. I could tell, I could tell when I saw Gino again because it had been four or five years since I had seen him the first time that he was in really really bad shape. I mean, he was really, wow. he was in very bad health. Right. And so I just said, "Look, I'm leaving this guitar here. Dave's going to set up this display case for you." You can come and get it out of the case anytime you want. Just come over here and play it, you know. And Gino was thrilled. And uh, and so basically uh, that happened. And then six weeks later, Gino died. So wow. it was one of these things that, that just I kind of just caught right at the very, very tail end oh, of it. And it, it, it made me really happy to, to put that guitar back in his hands again. But these are the kind of things that you do. And it's it just fascinates me. And, it, you know, it, it's... Um, my father and I run the Nebraska Performing Arts Hall of Fame, and he started the Nebraska Music Hall of Fame back in 94, but it's sort nice. of blossomed and changed and morphed over the years to a performance art hall of fame. And, you know, I do it. I do a lot of work with it. And, and it's like, um, I don't expect any pay. I don't get any pay. It's a nonprofit. And the stories, though, when you, when you um, honor somebody for their work that, didn't necessarily think they would ever be honored that way. It's yeah. it's a sense of like 
I, there's really nothing like that. And I got a lot of that vibe from from this kind of story uh, that you did in, in Gino's case. And it was just like, you know, you didn't have to, obviously you didn't have to buy the guitar and clearly you didn't have to give him back the guitar, but like, what a cool story, man. That's just awesome. You know, at the end of the day, I, I'm a collector. I like collecting guitars as, as anybody else does, but right. but it really means a lot more if you can have some sort of personal co connection like that. And, and, right. uh, and you know, like you said, just shine some glory on the on the old cats, man. Because yeah, Gene, Gino had done so much over the years and played with just about everybody, and he was a, he was a really great picker too. And sure, nobody yeah. knew him, you know. He was just right. completely in obscurity, and and it was really really sad. That's crazy. So That's I'm, I'm, I'm glad yeah. I was able to throw a little glory his way. Yeah, man, and especially like right to to the end of his life, like what an incredible way to go out, you know, just like to be reunited with the guitar. And, you know, I, I always feel like guitars have uh, always have a story, you know, and, and it, you know, if they can correlate with an individual that had some success, that's even better. That's yeah. pretty awesome. Now you, well, you and I'll, I, I'll just, yeah. I'll just add one other quick thing. When you say guitars yeah, yeah. have a story, I mean, after Gino died and, you know, I got the guitar back from Dave's guitar shop and all that, I'm looking through uh, a Willie Nelson box set book, right? And there's all these rare pictures that have never been printed before. And there's a picture of Willie Nelson and little Jimmy Dickens in like 1966. And Willie Nelson has Gino King's double neck around his neck and he's holding it. And he's like, he's, he's kissing the top of little Jimmy Dickens head. And I'm like, that guitar has so many stories that oh we will never know. You know, wow. there's a picture of Willie Willie Nelson holding that guitar. So, oh my gosh, that's incredible! So, is that guitar still in Wisconsin to this day? No, I got it back from Dave after. Uh, oh, after you did. You know, passed. Okay, so what do you, do, dude? What are you gonna do? You gonna start a museum at some point? And everybody's gonna pay to go through the Deke Dickerson Guitar Museum. Is that what's happening here? Well, <laughs> I live I live in California, you know, and they sell like you know tool sheds for a million dollars so i don't think that i'm ever going to be able to afford to uh to put together a real museum however uh <laughs> i have loaned quite a few of these guitars to museums for special exhibits and oh, things cool. like that oh, nice. and uh and i'm really happy to kind of do it that way to be honest yeah. because uh sometimes if you donate a guitar to a museum it just goes back in their you know the mm -hmm. bowels of the museum and it doesn't actually get on display yeah. whereas if you loan loan it for a special exhibit or something like that then it gets seen by a lot of people and and yeah. uh and so i i've done quite a bit of that and 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 i'm really happy to do that with uh, some of the instruments that i own that's incredible you know i i took a trip to uh uh Mem memphis and this is kind of a twofold story one in memphis and another in nashville but you made me think of Nashville going to the, the Country Music Hall of Fame and seeing like all of the stuff that's owned by Marty Stewart. I mean, Marty yeah. Stewart owns a ton of stuff in that museum. And I would almost say that a good por a good percentage of that museum is, is his, but he also has a, a ton of stuff in his, oh, and I don't think it's open yet, but he's planning on opening this second museum in, in his yeah, hometown. Yeah. In Philadelphia, Mississippi, yeah, Mississippi, yeah, which I'm sure you've heard I, of. I can't wait to uh, to go there. In fact, I I saw uh, Marty and the guys over the summer, and he said that they were still trying to raise yep. funds to complete the construction of the museum. I know that they they got started on it, but I think it's sort of uh, midway through. I'm not sure if they even know a date that it'll be open. They were trying to raise a lot of money from the last time I saw. Yeah. So that takes me to this interesting quip that I want to tell you. So my wife and I went down to Memphis. We were invited by Dale Watson to the Meropolitan Awards. And, uh, of course, my father recorded it at uh, Sam Phillips Sounds of Memphis Studio in 1968. They had a hit song called No Not Much on Buddha Records, which I'm nice. sure you're familiar with. Yeah. Um, and so I wanted to go down and sort of, you know, see all these places that Dad always told me about. and. And, you know, there's like missing tapes out there, which is like kind of this family folklore, you know. And um, 
he, he never did get the masters from that session. Um, and it was recorded by Sam's two kids, Jerry and Knox. Um, mm-hmm. Jerry still live, still living. Um, Knox passed away a few years ago, but so I went, you know, we went down to the, uh, the award ceremony. I got to meet Jerry at the award ceremony. He's like, Oh my God, never in a million years would I think I'd meet you tonight. And it was just this uh, unbelievable experience. But we also got to, uh, record at sun studios we were asked to record there and which was like you know a dream come true for me but um we pull up to sun uh to to go just on the like to see the museum and i shit you not marty stewart is standing outside of sun studio his head's in a guy's trunk and he's buying artwork out of a guy's trunk right in front of sun so you know it was just like a geographical location that he was like hey meet me at sun studio let's you know, and he had driven up from from Philadelphia, his hometown, and was just parked right there. And you know, he uh, he looks he looks over and he waves at my wife and I because we kind of parked right in front of it. And right. in fact, I parked illegally because I noticed who it was, and I parked in a handicapped spot. And I was like, "Oh my gosh, there's Marty Stewart!" And I'm a huge fan. And he just waved at us like we knew each other. And um, Anyway, long story short, we sat and talked for like 30 minutes and he was just the coolest dude. But I want to ask you about your, and and I urge everybody listening tonight to, after this show, Google Deke Dickerson on the Marty Stewart show. It is the coolest uh, performance I've ever seen on that show. And I've watched that show for years. I subscribed to uh, RFD TV to watch it and all kinds of stuff. And your appearance on that just blows me away. Tell me about that experience. Well, as I understand it, I was a sort of last minute replacement for Glenn Campbell because Glenn Campbell oh at God. that time was, was going, you know, through some health problems and things oh, like that. Okay. And, and, sure. and so I, I really only found out about it, you know, a week or two before it happened. And um, uh, it was on Ken, cousin Kenny's suggestion that they have me on there, and I was oh, like, really? "Yeah, let's let's do this." And so I remember that Kenny I before, did. You know Kenny before that? I, I had met him when they came out here. Uh, Marty and the boys backed up Porter Wagner uh, in mm. some of his last shows. You know, I think they oh. did a new album with him and stuff. And so, oh, wow. I I. I'd met Kenny at that show, and and you know, got pretty friendly with him. Uh, but then just kind of out of the blue, it was like, yeah, we want you to be on the show. Uh, and I was flying back. I was playing New Year's Eve in Germany and I basically had to fly back and then immediately get on a plane to, to Nashville. Oh my gosh. And, and I was like, yeah, well, I got to do it. I have to be on the Marty Stewart show. You know, I, I loved that show. And just the thought of being able to, you know, to be on it was, I was going to be in no matter what. Yeah. And they they taped that show very 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 early i think it was like 6 30 or 7 in the morning and of course i'm on california time which is two hours earlier oh and i had just come back from germany so i remember when when i actually got in the studio like i was like what <laughs> what day is it what time is it like You're i don't you know california just, guys here i was just struggling to like just stay oh, vertical you know what i mean because yeah. i was so out of it when, oh, once we were done with the show, I went back to the, the hotel that they got for me and I slept for like 11 hours or something. Oh, but uh, it was also funny because, you know, I, I told him what I wanted to do. And Kenny and I ran through the song the night before when I got into the hotel and we didn't have a chance to rehearse with the band, you know, and I'm thinking, wow, this oh, is just going to be on the fly. And I, I said, well, what if we screw up? They said, well. If you really screw up, we can do it again. But you know, I, let's just see how you how you do. And and so, you know, I they called me on the set in the middle of the show. Let's do the song, and we played the song, and we did this you know switcheroo thing where everybody kind of grabbed the hand of the double neck uh, at the end of the song. Yeah, you guys are all and, three playing the guitar at the same time. Yeah, and uh, and of course those guys are so damn good. It just it was a completely flawless and yes. uh and then it was over like you know and <laughs> all it was it was over quicker than than you know it it was like wow okay well we just did that so then uh wow and then 
yeah, that was that was a real honor for me. Yep. Um, I, I, I still kind of get goosebumps thinking about it, but it that was, blows it was my also mind. super weird and surreal, like, you know, doing it that early in the morning, being that out of my brain with uh, the time change and everything. And yeah, but it was it was a great experience. And and Marty and Kenny and Chris and Harry, they're just the, the nicest guys. They've always been super nice and very supportive of me. So I can't say enough good things about them. They just played Omaha a couple of weeks ago, the, the fab, fabulous superlatives, and uh, the mm-hmm. place was packed two nights in a row. But um, what blows my mind about that story is that, so a couple things, it's that early in the morning and they have a studio audience. Yes, although the studio audience was about 12 people. The way oh. that they filmed it, if you if you notice it, they, they used a couple of sort of quick cuts to make it look like there was a whole lot more and there was there was oh. definitely some some dubbed applause to make it seem like it was a bigger show uh, a bigger audience you know oh, wow. um, but uh yeah the, the the audience was about 12 people and Dwayne Eddy was in the audience which was you know I had invited him to come down and he wanted to come down and and see those guys again he had been on the show a year or two before oh that's so cool. you know just imagine the the pressure like here we are, Dwayne Eddy's looking right at you, you know. Yeah, oh, no sleep. Here we go. Oh yeah. my gosh. Well, the and the selection of music is not uh, typically something any band would be able to rock that well in twelve hours. Like that. That's it's pretty intense. What you what you did on the show that just kind of goes. Oh yeah, those guys are upper level. Totally. Pro. Yeah. And, you know, every, everybody that they backed up on that show, they did such a great job backing them up. And, and you know, people that are really difficult to sort of, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, I guess, I guess a good example is Jim Ed Brown from the Browns. You know, he did this thing on the Grand Ole Opry for decades where he was just kind of a, you know, schmaltzy, middle of the road singer. Uh, And then when they had him on the Marty Stewart show, they had him reprise his hit from the mid 1960s, Papa Top. And they started playing it and it sounded exactly like the original record. And I thought those guys are geniuses to have Jim Ed Brown on the show and have him do Papa Top. That was so good. But, you know, every episode was like that. It was just all so well done. Every single episode of that show is top notch. Yeah, it's just, uh, um, yeah, you know, Kenny Vaughn, you know, hearing that he, you know, plays at Robert's Western World once in a while, or he'll bop in and just make an appearance. It's like being in Nashville, you know, to me is kind of makes me itchy. But like, there's certain places like Robert's Western World that I love. You know, uh, Tootsie's is cool too. I'm sure there's other, there's a a couple other handful, handful bars that are like, you know, playing, still playing the good stuff, you know, but, uh, there, there's a lot going on in Nashville these days. It's it's a really happening town. Yeah, uh, it's a little it's a little bit too much for me when I go there. It's like you can't find a parking space. Right. You know, <laughs> everything's crowded. Everything's expensive. But uh, you know, if, if you were a guy who really wanted to, you know, a young cat who wanted to pursue a career, that that would be the place I would go. Really. So so I guess that leads me to ask you what what brought you to Los Angeles? They call you this. Hollywood guy, you know, even they, even on the Marty Stewart show, they introduced you that way. I thought it was pretty funny. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I, you know, I, it, it's so uh, uh, typical for people to put down Los Angeles and make fun of Southern California. And and I, I totally get it. You know, I, I get why that is, but there's some people like myself, the very first time that I came out here, I just said to myself, how long until I can live out here? I've got to move out here because this is where I want to live. Yeah. And I can't, I can't really explain it to you other than just uh, whatever it was that I had been looking for in my life. Uh, I was like, that's the place where I can live the sort of life that I want to live. And, you know, weather plays a big part of it, man. I I grew up in Missouri and I just really hated the winters and the hot, humid summers. Uh Oh, Hope we didn't lose you. We may have lost him. That's all right, folks. I'm going to uh, maybe we lost him for a second, but 
I think what I'm going to do, if we have a second. This. Oh, there you go. I think I'm back. You're back. There you go. I got a phone. I got a phone call coming in. Oh, right on, off. man. Sorry about oh, that. no worries. No worries. Okay. So, so but, yeah, uh, so the, the winter's in Missouri you know, on your cup of tea. Yeah, and, and, you know, the other thing about Los Angeles is that, uh, you know, when I was touring around uh, in my teenage rock and roll band, we went to New York City, and I really liked New York City. Oh, cool. But everybody I knew there worked three jobs and lived in a, a apartment that was like the size of a shoebox. Yeah. And when I came out to Los Angeles, it seemed like nobody had a job. Like, well, wait, how does that work? Like, all these people are just kind of gadabouts. Like, you know, they're just like, you know. And I'm like, so I'm in Missouri. And I'm like, man, I have to move to, you know, New York or Chicago or Los Angeles. And, and I just literally thought, nobody seems to have a a job in Los Angeles. That sounds like a great place. That sounds so, like a place uh, to be. Yeah. And I, and, you know, it took me a few years to sort of get my footing and, and uh, be able to, to do it, but I'm, I'm glad that I did. I still like it out here. and I really yeah. have no, no desire to move anywhere else. Well, not only have you had, uh, you know, managed to figure out how to get your songs on movies I've read and you work with yeah. Johnny Knoxville and, you mm -hmm. know, you, you, you seem to be the go-to guy for that too. You know, if somebody wants a song written maybe or something, you know, that's awesome. What a great, what a great get. Well, and, and one of the things that I've learned is that the only way you can make any real money playing the kind of music that I do is getting it in a movie or on a TV show. And so oh. that is, that is definitely one of the reasons that I have stayed in Los Angeles is uh just for those kind of things and i've been very yeah. fortunate to get quite a few things uh in johnny knoxville movies and you know just had a couple of songs in the new jackass forever movie this year and oh that's and, sweet. Uh, so yeah the the mailbox money the the royalties and residuals from those things that's what really you know makes makes the decision for me i'm, I'm sticking out yeah. here so can i ask you without picking too too deep into into that because i'm always curious i love you know, I've been a songwriter my whole life, but do you think it's because you're in LA or did you, did, do you have a publicist that works for you? I don't have a publicist. Um, you know, LA is one of these places where it's like, you got to know somebody and they yeah. have to recommend you. And, and that's right. kind of how it works. Right. Uh, and I think, I think Nashville is the same way too. It's all just this kind of interconnected network of thing. And so I've been fortunate that people who, let's say they want an authentic honky tonk or country soul or rockabilly thing in one of their TV shows or movies. Uh, they'll, there'll be somebody around that says, Oh, you should see this Deke Dickerson guy. He can do something like that for you. Right. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm not sure how much opportunity there is for our type of music in, in the movies and TVs, but I've, I've been very grateful for the, the things that I've been able to do. That's incredible, man. Well, I, I urge everybody to go dig deeper into into Deke's, you know, to dos and what he what he's done. But I want to. We don't have a lot of time with you, so I'm going to be very cognizant of where we're at time wise. I know you're currently in the process of selling gear <laughs> or something of the sort. But uh, uh, well, we got we got to talk about the Merle Travis book. I know that's what I want to get into. The Merle Travis book is the hot item that just came out. It was on pre-order forever. I, I threatened to pre-order one myself. And then I think it was you to, maybe you told me to wait. I can't remember. But then this is crazy. I want to tell you really quick about this uh, local connection. And you might get a kick out of this. Uh, a local DJ, his name's John Wagonmaster Schmidt. He's been a DJ at this radio station called KZUM here in Lincoln, Nebraska. And they don't call them DJs. They call them programmers. But yeah. He's been a programmer for 40 some years. It's incredible. But we just inducted him into the Hall of Fame last year. And he's such a cool nice. cat, big Western swing dude, huge fan of your music. Uh, and I asked him today, I said, hey, man, I got Deke on the show. Is there anything you want to ask him? And he goes, well, I just bought his book and I just kind of perused through it. I haven't read much of it. But um, he said, uh, he said, this is crazy. Lots of great photos, including Katie Ray's Aunt Bunny. Does this ring a bell to you? 
So there's Bunny, a there's Bunny a, Ball, huh? So yeah, so there's a local guy here in Lincoln. His name's C. A. Waller. He's a guitar player, okay. a really great guitar player, by the way. His wife is Katie Ray, and her aunt Bunny is mentioned in the book in a photo. And and I'll read real quick at the bottom of the photo. It says, "Here's here's a picture of Aunt Bunny at Merle's homecoming show in Ebenezer, Kentucky, in 1956. Merle and his special guest Gene Autry greet Bunny Mullins Baugh." who used to host Merle at the pickin' parties at her house in Ebenezer's at her house in Ebenezer where Merle was a boy. And that's I just found that to be fascinating. That's actually her aunt. That's so, wild. Yeah, super cool. But anyway, tell us about this book. And I know I know you you've always been a big fan of Merle Travis as have I. I I love all of his music. I'm a big Birds fan. I am a Pilgrim was on the Sweetheart of the Rodeo album. I mean, the stories that branch off from him are just maddening. But how did you get into this this whole thing? Well, as you mentioned, I was a fan, you know, being a guitar player and a country music fan. Of course, right. I loved Merle Travis. And over the years, it sort of occurred to me that it was very strange that there was not a Merle Travis book. Okay. Um, you know, because he was known for being like a, a great writer of all the country music stars i can't think of any who actually had this reputation as being a great writer and he would you know write magazine articles and and stories and things like that and he, oh really okay uh oh he froze again i also know merle travis was a great cartoonist and which i loved to cartoon things hopefully we can get deke back here his phone is refreshing there he is is he back there he is. <laughs> Awesome. I'm not. I'm not sure where I got caught out, cut off. But so you said he was a good writer. But I, th I then said he was a cartoonist, which I know that about him too. That's incredible. So I thought it was strange that he never wrote an autobiography, you know. And all these years later, I ran into his two daughters that lived out here in Southern California, Merlene and Cindy Travis. Oh. And I said to them, "There needs to be a book. How come there's not a book?" I said, "I want to write the book." And so we kind of stayed in touch for a year or two. And Cindy had been going through all the stuff that Merle had when he died, which was a lot of stuff, a lot of photos and memorabilia and letters and everything else like that. And finally, she asked me, do you want to come to Santa Barbara and look in this storage space? I was like, yes, of course I do. Yeah, and uh, she had she had done a very good job of you know organizing because I, I guess it was literally like in grocery bags and boxes and stuff that were oh. complete, completely unorganized taken out she of his done, house is it just stuff so when he his... when he died in 1983 his widow uh at the time kept it for another 10 years until she died and then when oh. she died merlene and cindy drove out to oklahoma brought it all back to California and put it in this storage unit where it basically stayed for another 30 years until oh Cindy started organizing this stuff. Wow. Uh, but, you know, nobody had ever seen this stuff is what I'm getting at. It was all pretty much unpublished. And Cindy reported to me like, look, there's some autobiographical writing in here. You should come take a look at it. And it was all raw, unedited. It wasn't complete or anything, but there was about 80 to 100 pages of Merle Travis autobiographical writing. And so I took that to Scott Bomar at uh, BMG Publishing and I said, there needs to be a Merle Travis book. You know, he's a country music hall of fame guy. He wrote all these famous songs like 16 Tons and Dark as a Dungeon. He had his own guitar style that bears his name. And right. we found 80 to 100 pages of autobiographical writing. and. Uh, Scott has been a really great guy to work with. Uh, he just said, yeah, this needs to happen. Go do it. And so I just started working on it. Uh, and the way that it's put together is kind of unusual. It's sort of part autobiography and part biography. And uh, the way that I set it up was like, look, we're just going to tell the complete story from, from top to bottom. And, you know, Merle's writing was real sort of spotty and just kind of covered from here to there, but not the whole story. So I just put all of Merle's writing in there and then just fleshed it out with my own writing to make this 480 okay. page book. 480 pages. Wow. Yes. Yeah. I was going to say, like, yeah, what, you know, what else was in the storage unit? What, like, what, 
Was there instruments? Was there like clothing? Con well, you know, considering the fact that, that Merle was a very bad alcoholic and he had been married five or six times and moved a whole bunch of times, oh, it's okay. kind of incredible that he saved all this stuff, but there was a ton of stuff. There was, you know, thousands of photographs, thousands of letters, thousands of, you know, show posters, uh, you know, little cards and, and matchbook covers and uh, all kinds of different stuff to pour through. Uh, and yes, they, they still have uh, a couple of guitars, a uh, couple of amplifiers, Western suits. And so, you know, just seeing all that stuff was completely mind blowing. Wow. That is absolutely incredible to be <laughs> say, hey, come come look through the guy's personal stuff. <laughs> How crazy is that? And and even weirder is, you know, at this stage in the game, it's it's kind of like late period for any of this kind of stuff being discovered for the first time. Right. So, you know, most of that stuff has already been hashed through in the 70s and then redone in the 90s. And then if something was coming out now, it's like the third time around. But this stuff had never seen the light of day. So it was really, really exciting just from kind of a music archaeology standpoint right so so were his kids sort of did, did his kids sort of filter some of it before you saw it or was it the first time that both of you were seeing it they didn't do anything with it for almost 30 years it just sat in the storage unit just completely oh, they didn't untouched. look through but, it or kind of know but as, as as i mentioned uh cindy started going through it in earnest uh for three or four years just trying to organize it and see what okay. was there and okay. this kind of this kind of parallel at the same time that I was bugging them about getting a book together, uh, so it it all kind of worked out in a in a very good way. It all kind of it came together, as they say. So, friend of mine, Rick Peters, uh, Rickabilly, he calls himself. He's another programmer on the station. Uh, his copy arrived today. Can't wait to read it. A nice. gal named Twyla Twang says, "What a treat! Thanks, Mike Simrod and Deke Dickerson. Awesome." Uh, let's see. Rick also said something earlier. He said the last time I saw Deke at the zoo, Cialis the gorilla was playing bass. Plus, the Bourbon Show was in April of fourteen. Way too long. That was the last time he played Lincoln. So yeah. So we had a guy in a gorilla suit playing <laughs> bass for us on a tour. Oh, nice. And we called him Cialis the Rockabilly Gorilla. And <laughs> we were we were sh we were shooting a documentary or, or a rockumentary, as you may oh, may call okay. it. And sure. we shot this hilarious scene where Cialis did not want to play the zoo bar because he thought it was an actual zoo and he would be put in a cage. Oh, so no. We've got this, is this scene. Is this available He's, for viewing? Yeah, you can see it on YouTube. It's in like 10 parts. Just, uh, you know, oh Google, uh, uh, just Google Dick Dickerson documentary uh, 2000. 13 or 14, I can't remember when it was. Oh my gosh, I, actually, I, th I think it was longer ago than that. I think Cialis was 2011. Okay. A long time ago. Oh my gosh, I can't wait to dig into that. That's incredible. So, so the pandemic, in a way, was sort of a, you know, oddly, it was sort of a blessing for you that you got to focus on this book, right? Well, so I, you know, we, we kind of signed the thing, the deal and the contract and all that in 2017. Okay. 2018 was the year that I did all the research. I made several trips. I interviewed about 70 people, including oh, wow. half a dozen people in their 90s who have all passed away now. Oh, my uh, God. You know, I, I went to Kentucky and Nashville and Mississippi and Arkansas and, and met all these people and, and Ohio uh met these people that had known world travis or who you know had stuff that would be good for the book 2019 i started writing the book and i and i got it kind of in skeletal form but then when the pandemic happened in 2020 basically the first three months where we were all kind of stuck at home not doing anything and all my shows were canceled right. i just sat down and i just finished that book and and i got wow. it done by May or June in 2020. And uh, so, yeah, I was actually fortunate that I just had three months with absolutely no distractions where I could just sit down and, and finish the book. That is crazy, man. Wow. And, you know, nobody really has a blessing in that type of situation, but, but uh, for you, it seemed to work out great. 
that's, that's well, and so, you know, as I mentioned, after I turned it in, in May 2020, then there was almost two years, a uh, year, year and a half, basically, where it was just kind of in limbo, like the publishing company wasn't putting anything out, we weren't really sure if it was going to come out or what was, you know, what the whole world of print books was going to be at after the pandemic. Oh, wow. They, they canceled a bunch of their book orders. I heard that. So I was really worried that they were just going to cancel this after I'd put all this work into it. But oh, sure. fin- finally, uh, last year, it was like, okay, we're going to print and we're going to put it out as a you know Amazon pre-order. Oh, great. This is going to be great. And then that's when we found out that there was this like this worldwide printing <laughs> shortage, uh, you know, with supply chain issues and the whole bit. And so that delayed the printing of it at like another nine or 10 months, something like uh, that. So it, wow. after all that happening, the book is finally out. Uh, it just came out last week, November 22nd. That is outrageous. And, you know, of course, everybody's heard about the shortages and the vinyl, even with vinyl records, it's hard to even so many people wanting printed and there's just not, not enough people printing. And The, the like craziest that. story about the book is that, you know, it was going to be a hardcover book. And apparently Amazon bought every single printing facility in the world that makes cardboard to make cardboard boxes to ship Amazon product. So they make hardcovers for books out of cardboard, right? So it's like all of a sudden, all these people that used to print hardcovers for hardback books, they're like, no, man, we're printing boxes for Amazon. Uh, so I, I know that in in the end, uh, just to get it done, that they wound up having to go with like one printer to get the hard covers printed, another printer to get the glossy photo cover, uh, pictures printed, and then another printer to print the the you know the text and then bind it all together. It was totally crazy, but oh my god, it's 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 nice to kind of have that in the rearview window. Yeah, you Frankenstein it together. Is there any way somebody could get a signed copy of the book? Yes, if they just go to my website, deekdickerson.com, and that's D-E-K-E-D-I-C-K-E-R-S-O-N.com. Uh, okay. Right there on the, the header of the, the front page is, a, you know, you can click a link there and, and buy a copy from me, and I will autograph it and uh, okay. we'll get it to you before Christmas. Hey, there you go, man. Awesome. That's great. Real quick, I just have a few more minutes with you. I know this. Uh, sure. This is this is so cool, man. I for, I really appreciate you doing this tonight, and what a great great experience this has been. But I do want to uh, talk a little bit about your guitars. I know we haven't really got into that, and we don't have a lot of time, which is silly to say to Deke Dickerson. We don't have a lot of time to talk about guitars, but I do want to yeah. I do want to mention Hallmark Guitars, a really cool kind of smaller boutique company. Um, yeah. uh a guy um, named Bob. Now, Bob, yeah. Bob is, he's a pretty cool cat. Um, funny enough, I talked to him. I talked to him this morning. Funny enough, uh, his name's Bob Shade. I called him because um, my father bought a guitar from him recently, uh, kind of a Moserite version mm-hmm. uh, that he had been. My father had been looking for a Moserite for years, and and then came across these guitars and. Funny enough, you had a guitar made by him. Now, this is the Model 2. From my understanding, he made you the first model. Um, it's definitely different than this version. Um, but just a little bit on these guitars, What? How, how, did, how did your relationship with Hallmark come to fruition? Well, I've known Bob for a long time, uh, basically just through being fans of Moserite guitars. And when he started the Hallmark company, I want to say around 2003 or four, the first things that he was doing was uh, reissuing some of these obscure Bakersfield era guitars from the 1960s, like the Hallmark Swiftwing and the Grugget Stradette. And I thought those were really cool. And and I also thought that they were really well made and, and sounded great and played great. And so I said, look, man, let's do a Dick Dickerson model guitar because I have a really good idea. Uh, the first model that we did was basically if you took a joe mathis double neck and you turned it into just a single neck guitar oh uh, sure funny funny enough mosrite had never really done that you know they had 
they had made a Joe Mapis model guitar, but it was very plain. And the, the, the whole idea with this model one was that it was going to be this flashy guitar with this armrest and this inlaid pick guard and this headstock with all this inlay on it. So it would kind of look like Joe Mapis's original Moserite double neck, but just as a single six string guitar. And that was very well received. You know, we sold quite a few of them, um, but it was a little bit expensive and it was kind of hard to make because of all the inlay and, and all that. So I know we don't have that much time, but you can see the picture on your screen of Buck Owens and Don Rich. Yes. I, I stumbled across this guitar and I knew I had seen this guitar somewhere. It was a it was a Mosley. It was like a 1969 Moserite, but it said Mosley on the headstock. Mosley. And I and I bought the guitar and I said, I know I've seen this guitar somewhere. It was not like a standard uh, model. It was very definitely a one-off Moserite guitar. And after a couple of hours, I'm like, yes, I know where I've seen this guitar. And I got out my DVD of the first episode of Hee Haw from 1969 oh. and there's a clip of buck owens and don rich doing johnny be good on the very first episode of hee-haw wow. and don rich is playing that guitar that was in my living room and oh i'm like God. there it is it's there's the one-off mosley thing and and make a long story short i i traded that don rich guitar to the buck owens people for speedy west's bigsby pedal steel guitar that's a whole nother oh, story wow. itself. you're kidding but i didn't i didn't have the don rich guitar anymore and i proposed to bob i said what if we make like a version two of the signature model guitar but it's more like this guitar that i just found that belonged to don rich it's kind of like a telecaster meets a Moserite. it's more stripped down there's not so much fancy stuff and inlay and and by doing that, we were actually able to get the the price point uh, right around a thousand dollars. So uh, we've been very successful with those, uh, even more so than the first model. And uh, I'm hoping to get another batch of them to sell this year. That's incredible, Speedy West uh, and Jim Bryant. I'm sure you're a fan of the 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 uh, the two guitar country style albums they put out are just outrageously yeah. cool and. What a cool like six degrees of separation there with guitars. That's so crazy. It's a it's a small world, man. And <laughs> uh, you know the, the the whole reason why I started collecting some of these historic instruments is because uh, I I just kind of thought like man some of these guitars just need a caretaker. For, yeah. You know the next the next twenty or thirty years they need somebody to make sure that they're preserved, not messed up. Uh, and for example, this Speedy West. Bigsby steel guitar. It was found in a trash lot in Bakersfield without a case. And a guy came into Buck Owens' offices and said, Hey, if any of y'all want a steel guitar, there's one in this trash lot outside of town. And so Did Buck he? and his his guitar player uh, after Don Rich, uh, Terry Christensen, I think is his name, they okay. drove out to this trash lot and they said, Oh, it's a Bigsby steel guitar. And they brought it back and put it into deep storage. Did that they know the who he was? No, because the the plate that had originally been on it that said, you know, custom made for Speedy West had been taken yeah. off. Oh, uh, wow. and the, the, the reason it wound up in a trash uh, trash lot is because it had been stolen from a guy there in Bakersfield who had it after Speedy. And oh, wow. it, it, so anyway, long, long story. But the guitar was just in horrible horrible condition it had been stored outside in bakersfield with no case right yeah. so it had been rained on and in the sun and everything else like that it had splits in the wood and it was just a mess and you know of course once i identified like that's speedy west steel guitar uh you know <laughs> I, I was like we got to restore that thing to where it looks like it came off the showroom floor in 1948 you know and oh and wow. so that that to me is what gives me the most satisfaction is just being able to sort yeah. of preserve these things for the next generation and and keep them out of the trash slots. Yeah. Well, I'm sure our mutual friend, Joel Patterson, uh, probably uh, salivated over that story. I'm sure he's a fan of, of Speedy. 
Well, and Joel's got a million great stories himself. He's a yeah, um, indeed, amazing indeed. entertainer, guitar player, and guitar collector. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, Joel used to walk in the shop when I first started at Old Town School selling guitars, and he would just like you know casually walk in the shop because he was a teacher there. Mm -hmm. And unbeknownst to me, you know, ten years later, he'd be like this you know, guitar legend. I mean, he's just so revered now. I mean, and the Beatles records he's put out and the Christmas record is unbelievable. And so, yeah, great, great six degrees there. That's pretty cool. Um, well, this has been a pleasure, man. And we didn't really talk about, you know, your studio. Are you, are you taking people, uh, bands coming through recording at your studio? Yeah. You know, I get a lot of remote work where people send okay. me tracks to, to mix or they send oh, really? me, uh, send me their own stuff that they want me to master or whatever. I get a lot of that kind of stuff, but yeah, oh, cool. it's available. You can, you can come and record here in the studio if you want to. And it's, it's kind yeah. of a mixture of old, old analog stuff, like the stuff you see behind me. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I also do pro tools and new digital stuff because you have to be able to do that yeah. when you're working with the, the TV and movie people. Right. But, uh, yeah. I, I enjoy doing that a lot. That's, that's amazing, man. Well, we almost need a volume two of this interview. So maybe we can do that down the road, but it, sure. you know, obviously you and I have a ton, ton to talk about. We barely scratched the surface on guitars, which is crazy to say, but I really wanted to talk about the book and where can people buy the book? They can buy it on your website if you want a signed copy, but what's the best place to, I mean, that's probably the best you, place because they buy it from you directly, right? If you want it autographed, buy it from me. If you yeah. want it like in two days, buy it from Amazon. Yeah. Uh, you can also get it from barnesandnoble.com. You can get oh. it. Uh, some Somebody, was, and now I forgot the name of it, but if you don't want to order from Amazon, there's like a, uh, it's sort of like the Amazon for independent mom and pop bookstores. And, and you know, a couple of people have ordered it from there and gotten, gotten it in the same amount of time, just a couple of days. Oh, great. Okay, cool. Uh, right now, I am a bit back ordered because I had a box of 25 books and I put it on my website, you know, Hey, if you want an autographed copy order here, and I immediately got 140 orders. Oh, and geez. so, so, and which is now up to 193 orders as of tonight. So I'm, I'm waiting on a shipment of books from the uh, warehouse in Chicago, but I should oh, wow. still be able to get that to you by Christmas time. If that's what you're worried about. Um, Amazing. but yeah, if you, if you want it like, tomorrow or the next day in order from Amazon. Unbelievable, man. Unbelievable. Well, yeah, please do. Um, you know, we've got some mad love from people on the chat for Deke Dickerson. Um, a lot of them are Nebraskans, so we got to get you back here. I'm, I'm a booker and a promoter and I do festivals and stuff. Let's make it happen. You promise? Yeah. Bring me out to that festival you do, man. That'd be great. I'd love that. Let's do that, man. Well, you go do your thing tonight. And again, Deke, thank you so much. It's nice to make your acquaintance. And um, yeah, moving forward, let's let's talk about a volume two. We could dig deeper in the well. Sounds sure. great, man. Okay. Thanks again for having hey, me. Th Cheers, buddy. Take care. We'll see you. All right. Well, what do you know? Man, Deke Dickerson in the flesh. Legendary guitarist, collector, storyteller, writer. Unbelievable interview. This is. Uh, one of my favorites thus far. This is, uh, I believe, episode 14, ladies and gentlemen. The show keeps growing. Uh, you can check this out uh, if you want the audio version. Um, you can listen on uh, all of your favorite streaming podcasts. If you heard some references you want to check out again of your favorite artists or maybe new artists that you didn't know about, there was a lot of names thrown around tonight. Uh, you can listen back on those podcasts. This will be up on the YouTube channel with the Nebraska Performing Arts Hall of Fame. Also on Red Rebel, um, where else? Zubar, I believe it's on the Zubar's page. So we'd like to thank the Zubar, Red Rebel Media, uh, Nebraska Performing Arts Hall of Fame for sponsoring this crazy talk show I do. And, you know, people seem to love it. So I'm going to keep doing it. And if you love it, let me know. I'll keep doing it. Because what do I like to do? I like to talk about gear. And I like to talk about stories, music stories, cool people. That's what I like to talk to. So, um, yeah, much love, everybody. I hope you enjoyed tonight. This was awesome. Thanks again for uh, coming on the show, Deke. Uh, and we'll see you when you come back to Nebraska and rock the house. All right, y'all. Have a good night. See you later. 
Do I have a closing? I do. Love you. I'm dishing with musicians. I'm dishing with musicians. I talk show about history. I'm dishing with musicians. I'm dishing with musicians. Let's take a stroll down music history.